Well, we are grateful to be able to continue on with the study of the Bible at this time period. We're thankful for the message we've heard in the devotional period. Many points of truth in that message that can help us all be mindful of what it is to be faithful to the Lord and serving him. And tonight I want us to try to finish up what we started with the first character that we're studying now, and that was Adam. Uh, we went over toward the end of last week's lesson, the 19 comparison points between Adam and Christ because we learned that Adam is a type of Christ. We sent that out to everybody. If you didn't get a copy of it, contact Sonia and she can send you a copy of those 19 comparison points uh, as to Adam and Christ and how they are alike. I want to stress uh, again the fact that the inspired apostle Paul calls the Lord the second Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 45 through 49. There is a definite sense in which we regain in Christ, thus in the church, his spiritual body, what was lost in Adam in the Garden of Eden because of sin. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we've regained, regained the close relationship, fellowship with God, which was destroyed by Adam's transgression. Death entered the world. They, of course, were removed from the garden where they could not partake of the tree of life, but they already had the effect, effects of partaking of the forbidden fruit in that they spiritually were cut off from God immediately, and as they were taken away from the tree of life, they began to die physically. Uh, thus, there was the reality on their part of a great change, which I doubt, as I've said a number of times, we can begin to comprehend because I can't, one reason, realize adults being sinless as a one-year-old, but they were, and thus they sinned when they violated that one positive divine law. So in Christ, friendship with God is restored. And this closeness is seen, and we could spend a long time just on studying this. And what is a very beautiful word to me, the word is reconciliation. Reconciliation. Now, when you use the word reconciliation, you have two parties that are separated, and they've been brought back together as if though they were never separated. And it is the entire scheme of redemption that is really all about reconciling man to God. God is the offended party. Man is the offender because he transgressed God's will. So separation from God's favor and from the tree of life brought about death. In Christ's church, we have life. So it's interesting that when a person becomes a Christian, he obeys a form of doctrine. That form is a form of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, Romans 6, 3, and 4. And thus, when he's baptized into the death of Christ, where Christ shed his blood, then the efficacious blood of Christ is applied to him. Because Christ was innocent, though tempted in every point, like so he are, he's without sin. Thus, he could go to the cross, which he did, and uh, die a vicarious death, which means on behalf of others. He did not deserve to be there. He had no sin. Thus, he died on our behalf. He shed his blood for the remission of our sins. That same blood, of course, he shed to purchase the church, Acts 20, verse 28. And thus, when we're baptized into Christ, we're baptized into his death, where his blood is shed. And it's interesting that there, the day the church started on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, we see that those people that gladly received his word were baptized as they were commanded to do as well as repent since they were already believers, Acts 2 and 
38, and the Lord added them to his church. Now, the Lord knows our hearts. He knows the motives. He knows why we do what we do. And thus, he knows whether we have from the heart, the whole heart, obeyed the gospel, as is said in Romans 6, 17, and 18. Thus, the church, the spiritual body of Christ, is the place of reconciliation, the fruit of the scheme of redemption, redemption being a person who's redeemed, he's bought back. It's like a, a slave, and somebody sets him free by buying his freedom. Well, God did that. And uh, we, being free moral agents, having understood their intellectual powers God gave us, the teaching of God's word concerning salvation, we've embraced it, and we believed in it, Romans 10, 17, and we thus completed our obedience to the gospel. And now we're a part of God's favor again. We are favored. We are in the grace of God. So the grace of God brought us the plan of salvation, the way of reconciliation, the way to become friends again, which Adam lost through transgression. And thus, death passed upon all men, as Paul said, because all have sinned. But death entered the world by sin, and that was Adam and Eve's sin. But we all then come to sin when we become accountable to God for our actions, Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23. So there has to be a way to bring the estranged parties back together as though they had never been separated. Now, that's what's amazing. Paul is saying when he says, I'm the chief of sinners, he's trying to say, if anybody could be saved, if I could be saved, rather, that anybody could be saved because of the things he did that were so terrible. And so it is with everybody. Now, of course, everybody won't be saved. But why is that? Not the fault of God. It's where the fault's always been. It's because people want to do as they please. Much of Ken's sermon uh, was about such as that. Uh, I think sometimes our greatest enemy is simply our will. It's not just the appetites of the flesh. That's how uh, we are approached by Satan, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, to get us to transgress God's will. But uh, people just like don't like to be told what to do. It just comes down to that. And yet everything from the Old and New Testament says plainly we're to obey God's commandments. Well, commandments, not a suggestion. It is something that must be complied with. We must do what he said and the way he said it and for the reason, and if there's more than one reason, the reasons that he said. There has to be complete obedience. He's the author of eternal salvation and to all them that obey him. Nobody else. All them that what? That obey him, Hebrews 5 and verse 9. So when you see reconciliation, when you think of Adam, when you think of friendship being restored through Christ, and Adam's a type of Christ, and it is done in the church. We have life, spiritual life, reconciliation, justification, fellowship with God here on earth. Now, if you don't get it here on earth, you're not going to get it on the day of judgment. Notice the Lord says to those on his right hand, the sheep representing the saved of the earth, well done, thou good and faithful servant. He was faithful before he got there. He didn't become faithful after he got there. He was faithful because he heard and believed and from the heart obeyed the gospel, God's power to save, and was reconciled to God. He was justified from his sin. He enjoyed fellowship with God as if he had never sinned. And that's important to understand in studying about Adam as to how, as anything in the book of Genesis tells us about the origin of all sorts of things. Now, notice I say again, in the Christ and his church, we have life. A person outside the church does not have life. I'm not saying the church saves anybody. I'm saying the Savior in the church. There are no saved people outside of the church of Christ as that term 
is used and defined in the scriptures. The Lord added the saved to the church. Who? Somebody else's church. No, he added the saved to his church. What church? The one he purchased with his blood, the one he promised to build, Matthew 16, 18. There are no Christians that are going to heaven outside of the church. That's God's family. God has his children in his family. We're reconciled to God in his family. And that's important to understand. Notice that the Lord in his work here on earth said that he is the bread of life. Also, he said, this is that bread which cometh down out of heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die, John 6, 50. Now, when do we eat of that bread? After this life is over? That's too late. We eat of that bread, that life-giving bread here in this world, that we might become Christians, one who is of Christ, a member of his spiritual body, the church. And again, the Lord said, I am the living bread which came down out of heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. John 6, verse 51. Is there anything vague about that? Anything difficult to understand? It's that kind of plain, frank, and candid language that got the Jews all stirred up. They couldn't stand for a person that looked like one of them standing there telling him such a thing as that. So we gained in Christ what we lost in Adam. Again, another important reason when we're trying to study with somebody to convert them to the Christ, get them to become a Christian, is to begin at the beginning and study about some of these things in the book of Genesis. So it looks to me like when you study this that we regain in Christ what was forfeited in Adam. We regain in the church what was lost back over there in the Garden of Eden. And in effect, I would suggest to you that the tree of life, that is life is given to us, spiritual life is given to us while we're in the fleshly body because of our acceptance of the truth of the gospel and submission to the terms thereof. So we don't just obtain that life when we stand before the Lord in judgment. And he says, come ye blessed to my father and hear it the kingdom prepared for you for the foundation of the world. Think about that statement. You're blessed of the father because of your attitude toward the truth of the gospel here on earth. Now, what is the attitude, the state of mind, the mindset that benefits from the gospel, God's power to save us from sin, Romans 1, 16? Well, of course, it's the one that will receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save our souls. So we become enlightened here. We are saved here. We have access to the tree of life. Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the what? The life. Well, when do we get that life? We have that life here in the sense we're reconciled to God. We're justified from our sin. And as we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. First John 1, 7. Now, if being faithful, the blood continues to cleanse us from all sin, do we have life? Or do we not? Can you conceive of a person who's continually washed in the blood that was applied to him when he was baptized to Christ's death because he lives faithful? Can you conceive of that person not having life? He's still dead. Well, the New Testament is full of material that says he's reconciled to God. He's made alive in Christ. We don't have a resurrected, glorified body like we will have at the end of the world, time of the resurrection. But we have the spirit that is cleansed by the blood of the lamb that will be able to be given 
that glorified body. John says, we do not know what we shall be like, but we shall be like him. Well, who shall be like him? The person that doesn't have spiritual life or the person that has spiritual life? Well, that's only those people that have spiritual life that are going to be like him in the resurrection. So it seems that we find spiritual life here. We lost it in Eden. We regain it in Christ in the gospel of Christ here. Now, I want to spend a little time as we um, look at this about emphasizing something that just does not get emphasized much today, although we talk a lot about what the Bible has to say about a scriptural marriage, about a man and woman becoming husband and wife, who's authorized to enter into a Matthew chapter 19, verse 6, God joined marriage. But we need to when you see how marriage is treated so flippantly. It's God who ordained marriage. It's God who thought of marriage. It's God who revealed marriage in the home for the good of the human race. In 1 Timothy 2.12, we've already alluded to that. And then Paul there, of course, refers back in the matters he discusses to the things that are in the lessons we've been talking about. When he's talking about the role and the status of a woman here on earth who is a godly woman. Now, if you don't want to be a godly woman, just go do whatever you're going to do now. But we're talking about people who want to be godly, people who heard the gospel, people who live, as the Bible says, people who are members of the church, people who want to live and please Christ. And that includes women. Paul, as an ambassador of the court of heaven, writing my inspiration, says to Timothy, a young preacher who needed to know it himself, and needed to preach it to the church for their information, said, but I permit not a woman to teach nor to have dominion, usurp authority over a man, but to be in quietness. Then Paul sets forth, and this is where I'm headed. Then Paul sets forth the explanatory reason for this injunction. And when he does so, he stresses, he emphasizes, that the principle under consideration is as old as Adam and Eve. He says, for Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not beguiled or in the transgression, but the woman being beguiled or deceived was the one that uh, fell into transgression, sinned, in other words. Eve sinned because she was deceived. Now, if you can, remember what Ken taught along that line in his lesson. Adam was not deceived, but he also sinned. He transgressed God's law. What's the difference? Adam just simply broke the law. Eve was led through the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, part of life, to believe and obey a lie. And Satan is the one that told that lie. Nevertheless, he sinned. He didn't go through that process, but he sinned. Eve sinned in assuming leadership over Adam. Now, people can call me whatever they want to call me or get all upset at old bachelor Paul, as the women's libs like to call him, and say, you're trying to relegate a woman to second-class status. Well, that's just not true. We're trying to relegate a woman to the status God placed her in. It does lessen her importance doesn't make her less than a man, simply says, I made you to do this and you ought to do this. So Adam sinned in becoming her follower. God never intended that. We need to do all we can. When we sit down to teach people how to become Christians, when you're studying with a young couple or whether it's single or whatever, they need to understand what happens when they become husband and wife. Adam sinned in listening to her. God said to Adam this, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. Now think about that. Because, that's the reason this is happening to you. Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Genesis 3, verse 17. Now, why is he suffering that punishment? Because he abdicated 
his responsibility of being the head of the race, the head of the woman. Leadership was set aside by him. He paid no attention to his own business and what God put him there to do. So in failing to demonstrate proper leadership qualities, Adam sinned against God, against Eve, against himself, and against all man. We need to get back to understanding when Jesus said, from the beginning it wasn't so. And he was starting to teach on marriage, divorce, remarriage, and reminded that in the beginning, it was one man for one woman. Each had a role to play. Each had a relationship to one another. God will not allow people to deviate from that and not go unpunished. Surely we see that from the study of Adam, Eve, and the problem of sin in the garden and what sins they actually committed. Well, my time is up tonight, and I want to have a word of prayer before we close and take up any other matters. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for thy word, for we would be left to drift and at the mercy of Satan in this old world. It wasn't for the guiding power of thy word. Help us to have hearts that will receive it and put it into practice and teach it to others to defend it. Bless us in all our Bible studies, private or in class, that we will benefit from understanding thy will for our lives. Help us in what time we have remaining on earth to study, to think about it, to meditate on thy word, to hide it in our hearts so we might not sin against thee. We pray it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Do we have any questions?